one of the most disliked white men in the black community, allegedly was black himself. That rumor doesn't surprise those who observe some of those blacks who pass over and become white bigots to cover their tracks, or perhaps they just suffer from self-hatred. But it sent Millie McGee back to her family tree in Macomb, Mississippi, to see if the man who became synonymous with the FBI and hatred of Martin Luther King Jr. was himself her cousin, who had gone through the special Underground Railroad built from the South to Washington, D.C., for blacks who looked white enough to live. Secrets Uncovered, J. Edgar Hoover, Passing for White. And I said Passing for White because there's a question mark. Why the title Passing for White question mark? Because when we first, when I first started writing the book, I did not realize that J. Edgar Hoover was actually in my lineage. And I was told it was rumors in the family that he was and just rumors. So I knew that I had to put question mark until I did some research and made out for sure that he was a part of the family. Now this is a... Uh, pretty serious charge, uh, and not because there's anything wrong with being black, but because uh, of the other implications. Uh, do you feel comfortable uh, making this charge that J. Edgar Hoover, are you saying, in effect, he was black? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying, in effect, that I'm a black woman and he is in my family lineage. He is a part of my family. Uh, I don't necessarily like it. Uh, I didn't even know it when I started it, but when I found it out, I was looking for my great-great-grandmother, who is Emily Allen, who had babies by his ancestors. And after doing my research, after two and a half years of research, I have, without a shadow of a doubt, in my heart and the documents showing that he is a part of our lineage. Now, to say that he's passing for white or he is black, 
I personally wouldn't say that. I would say that he has uh, black blood in his veins. What does that make him to you in terms of uh, 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 relative? Uh, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, is his second cousin. And that makes him what to you? That makes him my fourth cousin. Fourth cousin. <laughs> yes. And uh, what part of the country are you from? Is your, is your family from? My family. I was born in Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, and my family is from Macomb, Mississippi, Summit, Mississippi, which is where the Hoover Plantation is in Summit, Mississippi. I would say the uh, nine children that my grandmother had by Master Hoover, they are, um, a lot of them are passing for white. My grandfather's father married uh, a black woman, a mulatto woman, and my grandfather himself married an, a Choctaw Indian, which that's what I am, an Indian, and, and black. Even the white people are uh, proud of the book, the ones that I've spoken to, and they agree with me that my grandmother, well, well that's how I closed the, the, all the research by getting documents from them because we have to keep in mind that uh, black history, handed down oral history, is not documented history. And uh, two and a half years of research looking for oral history, I won't find it. So after doing some radio announcements about what I had found in, in the pedigree chart and from word of mouth and from rumors, uh, one of the Hoovers, a uh, couple of the Hoover family members heard it and they had also been doing research of their own and trying to find out themselves how did J. Edgar Hoover actually belong to the white side of the family. And they couldn't understand it. They could find all of the birth certificates of everybody else in their family, but they couldn't find J. Edgar Hoover. Now, the people you're saying they, are these white people these who are, are white, Hoovers? These are the white Hoovers. Well, why would white Hoovers be interested in whether or not J. Edgar Hoover was black or white? I would, think, I would think because of the way they were treated by J. Edgar Hoover when he was alive and uh, the family have wondered why they were treated the way they were treated. How were they him. treated by him? Well, pretty bad, uh, where they, they weren't really considered a family member to them. To them. He was, they were disinherited from, in his will. He had nieces and nephews and he disinherited them. And it's not that I believe they wanted money from him. They just wanted to know why he would attach himself and then be so cold hearted and treat them so distant. You know, um, the information that I found, a picture uh, that he put in his biography saying that it was him. And it wasn't. It was one of the white Hoover boys. Well, I, I wouldn't say he was actually white because it seems like, according to the research, he was uh, mulatto too. Uh, I wasn't doing research to find out and discover and say that he was he was was also uh, a black man. Now this is this is his brother. This is what the one that he called his brother. Now this is his picture, which is in the Hoover Room at the Masonic Shrine, right, in Washington D.C. Exactly. And when you go into the Masonic Shrine, there is a a, a man and a woman identified as Jagger Hoover's parents with a little boy. Exactly. For years, this little boy was identified as J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe he's identified as Davidson Hoover. He's, he's identified as... Who is J. Edgar as, Hoover's brother. Uh, yes, Dickerson. 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 Dickerson was 15 years older than J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the picture, you look very close at the picture in my book, uh, the paper on that picture shows that it was much older than J. Edgar Hoover. It was made before, but he said that that's when he was five years old. And he has a picture of him when he was four years old. And you look at them, you can see that it's two different faces. There was a picture that is still in the Masonic Shrine in Washington, D.C. Right. That for years, in the identification on the picture, it identified it as J. Edgar Hoover, the little boy. That's right. At one point in time, at the Masonic Shrine, they changed that identification mm -hmm. to Dickerson, Hoover rather than J. Edgar Hoover. Exactly. So something had to happen that uh, made the officials at the Masonic Shrine change the identification uh, of that little boy's picture. For years, uh, in the black community, it has been a widespread rumor during J. Edgar Hoover's life that he was a black who was passing for white. Exactly. Uh, this does not mean that's true. This means that it is true that there has been for decades mm -hmm. uh, during his life even among whites, even at the FBI. Mm -hmm. And according to your book, even Hoover was aware there were rumors that he was a, a, a mulatto. Mm -hmm. And you quote a very famous uh, white man here who we will not name, 
who grew up in Washington, D.C. at the same time, mm -hmm. who you quote as saying uh, that uh, he also heard the rumor mm -hmm. and that it was believed among the whites in his community, mm -hmm. in his uh, circle, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, J. Edgar Hoover was passing for, uh, for, for, for white. The document that I found in research in, in the uh, library of his, him, his birth certificate being forged is where in Washington, D.C., the mother and father list their names and they list a number to go find the child's birth certificate. Someone went into the file and wrote in, handwritten his name and wrote a code W uh, M, white male, and all the other parents on that list never list a child's name or whether it was white or black, which send up a red flag to me. You said to, wrote in his name. Wrote in J. Edgar Hoover's name under his parents. That's the only baby that was written in on that whole page, which sent a red The rest of it was typed? They were, all, they were all handwritten. Everybody's name was handwritten. The parents would go in and log your name, mm -hmm. and you would log, then this clerk would log a number that you go to, and then you pull the records, and you look for the child's name and, and gender and, and, and that. But on this record, someone went in and actually wrote J. Edgar Hoover, his date of birth, and a, a code WM which didn't make sense to me. Who cares? I mean, nobody else in that whole uh, page did that on, on hardly anything. In other words, no other baby on that page was identified by race but Jed. Or Hoover. name. Or name. Or name. And they all had a code number that you went to. That's right. But in his case, there was not only a name, there was also WM designating him as a white male. Exactly. And that sent up a red flag that, that made you suspect something, right? Right. And then when I got the anonymous package from the family, I read and looked into it and found uh, documents showing that my grandmother was owned by his, his relatives. And then uh, the birth certificate finally came, and I noticed that in order for him to get a birth certificate, he had to take his brother, who, he, who was in that picture, Dickerson, with him all around uh, Washington, D.C. to different churches to get him to do a statement and have it notarized saying that he saw him being born in the house. He was 15 years old and he saw J. Edgar Hoover being born by his mother. Now, which of J. Edgar Hoover's parents allegedly is of uh, an African ancestry, the mother or the father? Uh, it, would be, it would be allegedly the father would be the uh, mulatto. But I understand through my research, the mother was mulatto too. When you started the research in uh, Mississippi, you say that the uh, White Hoover family, some of, the, of them anyway, were uh, very much in tune to what you were doing and they wanted to help you in your research. What did you find out? What is the lineage? What is the line in your family that gets us, uh, that connects your family to the, J to the Hoovers, to the White uh, part of your, uh, of, of your background. My, my great-great-grandmother, Emily Allen, was uh, impregnated by the slave master uh, with her first child, and her first child was called Ivy Hoover because he was born on Master Hoover's birthday. Master Christian, Christian Hoover was born on November 24th, and so was uh, his uh, son by my great-great-grandmother, which was named Ivy Hoover. These were handed down stories. These were nothing documented. So that's what started this book, was the handed down oral history told to me by my grandfather and my mother for, de for years. That, that is, those are stories that I remember my mother telling. You know, I'd like to, to interject this. I remember years ago, uh, I interviewed uh, one of the top white historians in America who lives in Virginia. And he was for years the historian who uh, refuted any possibility that uh, Thomas Jefferson could possibly have uh, had children consecutively by a black woman. Mm -hmm. And he rested his case on the fact that uh, Thomas Jefferson just had too much character to have a relationship with a black woman. I'm not saying that you're, what you're saying is right nor wrong. I have no idea. I'm getting the information from you. But I am saying that one should keep in mind when listening to stories such as yours that what you're saying was conventional. It was the way America was. Exactly. Uh, white men uh, who had property, which were black females, 
And I, in your book, you talk about black women were frequently used as, quote, bed, bed warmers. warmers. Now, by that, you mean uh, they were in intimate well, the, relationships? It was, a term, it was a term that the slave master used for when he wanted to warm in his bed. Or it, it was actually rape, but she right. would have to bed take care of him. Bed warming was the conventional, conventional right. term. Mm -hmm. I'm saying for those people, particularly the young people who may say, ah, how in the world could that have happened? That's the way things were during that time. Right. And uh, parents and grandparents always told those stories because we had no documents. Of course, the slave master is not going to uh, make record that he bed warmed one of his slaves and made children with her. Even back that time, you couldn't even name your children, his surname, which was surprising to me that this one child, and that's what always intrigued me by the story, that they had eight, uh, well, at that time, they just said a bunch of children. I know now, because I've done the research, how many, but she just said a bunch of Allens and one Hoover, and my mother said she would always wonder, why is Uncle Ivy a Hoover and all the rest of them, and they're all Mommy Emily's children? And so she said one day she asked, and they told her that, oh, he looked more like the master. And I believed that as I grew, but after doing the research, I had to be logical and try to figure it out. I wanted to figure it out. Was it really because he was whiter or he was more like the master? No, they all were. When I look at the pictures, they all were white. They all looked white. And what it really was is that this child, this one child was by the master. He wheeled her in a wheel to his son, who was William Hoover, which the other seven children were, were fathered. So, and also the master, who is Christian Hoover, who impregnated her first with Ivy, was born November 24th, and so was Ivy. So I put that together and I said, first son, by the master on his birthday. He felt good about that. I'm going to name this son Hoover which I felt was the mistake. You did a little detective work. <laughs> right. I, yes, I did. Uh, two years of really trying to analyze. I mean, I took this history and I analyzed it, age and dates, and I put it together, who was first and what they did. That's how I walked through it. Did you get any professional help? Uh, oh, yes. I had to. Uh, I called Salt Lake City because I went on the Internet and couldn't find anything. It just kept saying no documents and when I would check into the, the Hoover uh, lineage. So I called Salt Lake City, the Mormon church, the uh, library was there, had, they had everything. So I got in touch with a, a genealogist by the name of George Ott, who is very, very good. He, he does studies, he does teaching, and we hired him. And he worked with us, us for over two years. With now you, you paid him? To, oh, to yes. <laughs> we paid him. Now, w w and, and he is an acknowledged expert in this area? He, he is. W what, what were his conclusions? What were his findings? His finding is that, um, he said to me, Millie, he said, your oral history and the writing of your book, what I read in your story, matches documents better than when he, because he, he has a lot to do with Alex Haley's uh, book. And his book was oral. A lot of it was oral history, you know, handed down stories. Alex Haley's. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so he said, you, your documents match more. And then the documents that were sent to me by the family, the wills, the death certificates, and the birth certificates, he said, I'm convinced that without a shadow of a doubt that your grandfather did not lie to you when they told you your oral history. There's another interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that you develop in your book, and that is there was a particular specialized underground railroad for light-skinned blacks from the South to get to Washington, D.C., and then to set them up so they could pass for white people. Yes. I thought that was the most interesting part of this research to me, and that was due to the genealogists and, and going through the libraries and finding this out. And then uh, I, I think, uh, if I can remember, the professor that did a large study, uh, uh, was it Stouffer's, um, on, on passing for white, I, I realized that there was a underground railroad for passing for white. It was very unique. And when they went through the procedure that they set up, it's like from Virginia to Washington, from Washington to, and from Maryland all the way to Washington, they had this house where 
they would go through the back door where the, where the uh, mulatta, because most of the mulatta people were, and they'd come out the front door and say, this is my cousin. The white who would say, this is my cousin from Baltimore. Well, looking at that cousin, you don't know that in blood is a drop of blood, black blood is in that person. Blue eyes, some of them had brown eyes, but they had straight hair, blonde hair. And I have cousins today that I look at, I, honestly, I can't tell that they're not Caucasian, but they are. They we are, all do. They, that's right. As we a all matter have. of fact, you remind me of another instance. Uh, I don't know if you're a student of J.A. Rogers or not. His, the, the, uh, he was a black historian. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you might want to read J.A. Rogers if you haven't because he was doing research 70 years, 60, 70 years ago, right down the lines that you're doing. And they held a contest in Washington, D.C. back in the 20s or 30s. And they had an Abraham Lincoln look-alike contest. Wow. And the man who won the contest one year turned out to be black. And I think they canceled the contest after that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So the, the, and J.A. Rogers had a saying that I really love. He said, to be an expert on race, the first qualification is to be crazy. Because there is a human race. But in America, we haven't gotten around to that yet, but we're working on it. We're making progress. <laughs> yeah. So for us to say, and I'm sure people watching this interview are, oh, how could she say that this man was black? Or how could somebody say that this man or woman was white? When in effect, there are many people in America who don't have much idea in terms of uh, what their so-called racial exactly. uh, mixture is. This book was about people looking and saying that I'm not ashamed of my bloodline. Yes, I have a, some black blood in me, and I have some Caucasian blood in me, I have some Indian blood in me, I have some Oriental blood in me. That's what it's about. It's about us looking at each other as one, as a human race, and not starting to say, well, you, you, you can't have this job because you're black. You're not smart enough. It's the not realities of our social organization as a society, however, are that uh, although what you say is legitimate, what all of us feel, people of goodwill feel. But there is a, in people's minds, there are differences. And in the minds, in the mind of the man who was called J. Edgar Hoover, mm -hmm. uh, he seemed to have great difficulty uh, in accepting people who happened to be of African ancestry. Uh, his uh, record as director of the FBI, uh, the uh, anti-Martin Luther King uh, uh, mania almost, his uh, Cointel Pro programs, uh, special programs aimed only at black leaders, uh, a very intolerant legacy he has left. And then to hear your evidence, whether it's right or wrong, that he himself uh, was of the same bloodline of the people that he spent so much time uh, not protecting in his official capacity. And there's one exception. He did Lyndon Johnson a favor down in Philadelphia, uh, Mississippi, when he went after the Klan. As a matter of fact, he may have broken a few rules to put the Klan in jail. But with the, that exception, his, his record in terms of black people was not favorable. How do you feel well, when you being think of uh, a black person who is a relative of a man with that kind of record? I, I feel anger. I feel very angry when I first saw that, and I said, how can he be? And I, I then realized when I was little, uh, I'd say little, 16 years old, watching television when Martin Luther King was killed, Martin Luther King was just my idol. He was my hero. I loved him so much and still do today. I remember clenching my fist on the floor looking at that television, wanting to go through it because he was on there. Uh, saying mean things even at, after his death, you know, and how... He meaning Hoover was saying. J. Edgar Hoover. Mm -hmm. And when I would see his face, I would wonder why I had such... I just would rip my... I was so angry. Were you I, aware at that time? Or did you believe at that time he was your relative? No. You had I no want, idea. I had no idea. And when I did this research and saw his name, I was even... I, I could see myself clenching again, and that's when I realized I had been told at 10 years old that this man would have killed us all if we had told who he really was. You say in the book that you were warned. Did the warning come after you started your research? Or are you saying that the family all along 
just was silent because it was afraid that if it did speak up, members of your family, That's right. that something would happen to That's them? That's right. The family itself uh, was afraid. There was a murder. And you were in rural Mississippi. Yes. So something bad happening to a black person and something during that era mm -hmm. in particular was not... Mm -hmm was not out of the question, mm -hmm. was it? Yes, right. And I, while doing this research, I found out that there was a murder in the family. And it's been, nobody knows what happened, who it was. Well, we know who it was, but why? And it's, it's rumors that this particular person was starting to open his mouth. And I believe that my life was saved when my grandfather frightened me, just, just frightened me to death, I put it that way. He, I mean, I found my little self shaken. And when I even talk about it, at 50, I'll be 53 years old soon. When I talk about it now, when I say I, I find myself shaken because I remember just shaking. He said, you cannot go tell your friends because he just blurted out, that old goat is my second cousin because I asked him about the Hoover man because I was in, in my history class studying J. Edgar Hoover. Not having any idea? Not having any idea. I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And I said, Big Daddy, I just want to know. Is this man related to, had anything to do with the Hoovers that had my grandmama Emily? Mm -hmm. That's the way I said it. And he said, Grandmama Emily, he said, yes. He said, he said, but he said, he, he said, that old goat is my second cousin. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go tell my friends. Now, as much as I didn't like him, even at 10, because people had said such bad things about him, but at 10 years old, he's the FBI, he's a director. I just thought, oh, they need to know. I'm related to that man. And my grandfather said, no, no, no. You can't do that. Then he told me that we would all be killed. And, and at 10 years old, I'm going to be responsible for the death of myself and my whole family. I, I, I couldn't understand it, and it just frightened me. So I prayed and asked God to take that memory away. I woke up the next morning. I cried myself to sleep. When I woke up, I had no memory of J. Edgar Hoover. But I remember after that, because I used to be very inquisitive, always wanted my grandfather to tell me those stories. You know, it was just wonderful to sit and listen to old people tell stories about who belonged to you and who's your relative. It was just fascinating to me. But after that day, I found myself not wanting to talk. When, I, when they would have the meeting and they start talking about the heritage, the legend, or, or about Grandma Emily, I would leave. I would find myself, and, and that, would not, that was not me. Well, I don't know what made J. Edgar Hoover tick, because I'm not a psychic, but I do know from my life experience that I have noticed a number of... Uh, black people who are passing for white, it seems that many of them tend to become very overt bigots and maybe posturing themselves in the white community as a racist is their way of keeping, other, keeping white people from suspecting that in effect that they have black, mm -hmm. a black uh, lineage. Okay, when, when a black person gets in a room with another black person, you take on each other's characteristics. I can go in a room with all white people and I'm out of place and I'm not going to take on that characteristic. So the way I see it is if he were in the room with Martin Luther King or with someone else, they might see his characteristic because it would fall down. It's just the way we are. Or and he, we would, all even, know he that would fear that he it would, might. And he know it will. We know it will. We, we, we are, it's just a part of us, if you think about it. We know each other, and you know the characteristic. You can look at him and tell. If you really take a look at that picture, you could see the characteristic of African American in him. Well, and I think if you take the, uh, the photograph of uh, most people, uh, you can see all kinds of different mm -hmm. uh, uh, racial or ethnic backgrounds. In them. Exactly. Thank you very much for being Thank with you me. very much for having me. Tony Brown Productions produces this program and is solely responsible for its content.